Yeah, hello everyone and welcome to this new episode of Pacific Talks Season 2. I'm your host, Philippe, and in this podcast I engage in active conversations with my guests to talk about global challenges through an island perspective. Today we are continuing our special series dedicated to the speakers of the Virtual Island Summit 2022 organized by Island Innovation, of which we are an official media partner. For this episode, I shared a conversation with Diana Kerner, Sustainable Tourism Consultant and co-founder of the Seychelles Sustainable Tourism Foundation. So now, on to a conversation with Diana. Diana, Yorana, hello, welcome to the Pacific Talks. Good morning, Philippe. Uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, for those of us who don't know you, can you tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and your career? Yes, of course. So um, I'm joining you today from, from Zanzibar in the Indian Ocean. Um, I'm originally from Germany and have lived here in the Indian Ocean region since uh, 2016. Uh, I'm a freelance sustainable tourism consultant. Um, yeah, I'm very passionate about um, sustainability in tourism and have worked on a range of different um, projects over the years. Um, I work for a consultancy um, that is based in Germany, uh, which is called Mass Contour, that is specialized on um, giving support um, for developing destinations um, in sustainable tourism planning and management. And here specifically in the Indian Ocean region, I was first uh, living in Seychelles for a couple of years, where I co-founded uh, an NGO together with the local Seychellois um, and the NGO is called Seychelles Sustainable Tourism Foundation. So the aim was to create a platform which can really bring together tourism stakeholders um, from public, private sector, NGO, academia in Seychelles to work towards a joint vision for sustainable tourism in the country. So we started different uh, projects, initiatives, events, um, also conduct research um, to support um, evidence-based uh, policy makings and, and decision makings. Um, yeah, and work closely with the Ministry of Tourism, um, Hospitality Association. Um, so, so yeah, I was doing that in Seychelles and also still continue to support the foundation. Now, currently, I'm based in Zanzibar, and here, among others, I work for the uh, Chumba Island Coral Park, which is a private marine protected area, actually the first of its kind in the world, and it's entirely financed through ecotourism. So we have an eco-lodge with seven eco-bungalows, which um, finance the um, conservation of the private uh, marine protected area and forest reserve, and also an education program for local school children and community members. So, and additionally to that, because I'm very much into sort of, yeah, developing and supporting ecotourism in protected areas, um, I also am the chair of an NGO called Thinking Tourism and Conservation, which is based actually in Norway, but it's a global network whereby we bring together examples from around the world where tourism in some form or the other supports the establishment or the management of protected areas. Hmm. Wow, that's uh, quite a busy schedule, I guess, on a daily basis. <laughs> um, so you, as you said, you're talking to us from uh, Zanzibar, uh, which is unusual in our podcast where we mainly focus on Pacific islands. Uh, but this is also a beautiful island, even if it's not in the Pacific. Uh, and we're definitely uh, facing similar challenges in terms of economic development, as uh, your island is also relying heavily on tourism and agriculture. So for our audience to be able to understand the, the situation of uh, the island, can you just give us a little bit of, uh, of an overview of the situation today? What are the challenges that Zanzibar is facing and uh, specifically maybe in terms of uh, tourism? Yes, absolutely. And I really appreciate the invitation because I think it's great that we have this exchange among islands. Um, so Zanzibar um, is an island um, which is off the coast um, uh, of Africa, so actually quite close to mainland Africa. It's about a 45 minutes uh, ferry ride or one and a half hour ferry ride from, um, from Dar es Salaam to, to Zanzibar. We have a population of about 1.5 million uh, people here in Zanzibar and get... Pre-COVID, we had uh, 
roughly half a million uh, tourist arrivals. Um, I think tourism here and even throughout the pandemic, honestly, has been booming. Um, Zanzibar was one of the first destinations to reopen its borders. And we've had um, a lot of uh, sun and beach um, tourism coming in even, even throughout the pandemic where other parts of the world were completely locked off. Um, so here, this is really the, the main characterization of our industry is the classical sun and beach holiday destination. We have a real boom when it comes to tourism uh, accommodations, so big resorts, um, different kinds of um, beach uh, ho hotels and accommodations. Um, and yeah, mainly we rely on the sort of European uh, source markets. Um, and yeah, classical sort of sort of beach holiday here. But that comes with, um, unfortunately, quite a lot of challenges in terms of meeting the demand when it comes to, to nat natural resources here, um, waste management, uh, e providing electricity, um, food. Um, a lot of the food used here in, in tourism is unfortunately imported. Um, the numbers are as high as 80%, which is really shocking because the capacity would definitely be there to to provide more um, or to add it more to the to the supply chain um, and yeah just generally um, I think it's uh, tourism is very concentrated along the coast so um, so yeah a lot of pressure on the coastal environment and not so much trickling down to the local communities um, as ideally it, it should be yeah mm, indeed and and the paradox of all this is that uh, those islands such as Zanzibar and many in the Pacific uh, they rely heavily on tourism to sustain themselves. They are otherwise low-income uh, countries. Uh, but yeah. today we know it, and maybe the, the COVID pandemic helped to have this kind of realization, but tourism is uh, is questioned because of its environmental impact. Uh, people are flying to our islands, which are quite uh, far away. So there's a lot of, uh, of carbon footprint. There's, as you said, a big uh, footprint on in terms of, uh, of food uh, and, and all those elements. So uh, as we're trying to develop island economies and, and find ways to do it sustainably, uh, can tourism still be uh, a key option for our islands? Uh, I would say definitely yes. I do really strongly believe in tourism and um, I see through my work, as I was mentioning before in the Linking Tourism and Conservation Network, we have so many examples where tourism really is this force for good. Um, mm -hmm. One of the examples I see here in in Zanzibar is with Chumba Island, whereby really through ecotourism, we manage the um, entirely up until the pandemic, entirely finance the um, the patrol of the park, the conservation activities within the park, and bring around 350 school children and community members free of charge to the island each year um, to teach them all around sustainability sustainable development, marine conservation, make them access the ocean often for the first time in their life because many of the islanders, not sure how it is on your end of the world, but many people here don't actually know how to swim. So um, opening up this world for the kids is, is really life-changing in a way. Um, and then sort of anchors everything that they learn much differently if they then also see a coral reef with their own with their own eyes so all this is possible through tourism and seeing also the kind of travelers that come to chumba island you see that these are people who care about nature who want to have a sort of also more educative experience while they travel so they're very interested they're very they're also very concerned though about their their footprint so this is something that comes up again and again in in my work and the different projects especially here in the islands is how do we break yeah, how do we break free from this um, sort of reducing CO2 emissions, yet we are kind of reliant on, on long-haul travel or air travel here um, to our island. So I think one of this, the aspects there is really to say, how can we generate as much positive, if people travel to our shores, how can we generate as much of a positive experience while they're here? And Islands as ours often ha are these biodiversity hotspots in the world, right? So we want to make sure that tourism can, in a way, support finance or through education, support these, these biodiversity hotspots, which are then also supporting the, the climate battle worldwide. So, so that's really something I, I strongly believe in. Um, but 
generally, yeah, it, it is a it is a big a big challenge because overall, I would say as a sort of general destination direction here in Zanzibar is pretty much towards like development, short term development, you know. So we really have to shift from that and and think more strategically. Um, what are the kind of tools we want to attract, and how do we create the most meaningful experience for them? Yeah, yeah. So, and as you said, that requires a new framework from for the industry to kind of like move from mass tourism, which is kind of like still or was the rule until quite recently, to move to something new and a new way to develop this industry. So, uh, regarding your experience, what would be the major principles that you would recommend, and what would be the main key point, uh, key attention points to keep in mind while trying to shift the industry to something more sustainable? I, well, I think it, it all comes back to, to management at the end of the day, to have a strong framework in terms of government, but also private sector realizing its, uh, its responsibility because private sector does have a huge responsibility in tourism as well. To, so to create a framework where there is dialogue and, and cooperation and where there's management. And then, of course, it comes down to the three pillars of sustainability in terms of ensuring that we have um, an economic balance, especially in the context of islands, that we ensure that there's a low degree of leakage. What we see here is, you know, so many foreign investors, as I said, imported goods. So how much of the money actually stays in our islands it's not um, not so much as it could be right so creating strong local value chains um, and that also then gives communities also more ownership and more ways also to integrate then their local culture into the into the tourism product um, and then of course in terms of environmental aspects um, it's not only just reducing impacts but really I mean the key word here is regeneration like how can tourism make a place even better and which is so crucial for our islands because pretty much our main attraction in most of the cases is our environment right and if we really at a tipping point it blows my mind sometimes here in Zanzibar where we have so-called attractions like a snorkeling experience and the way these reefs are treated it is just a couple of years until they will be completely decimated yet you know we do not care care for our own um, tourism products yes yet they are um or these places, yet they are the main um, attraction for the guests. So it's kind of mind blowing. Um, but yeah, I think so the aspects having these three pillars in mind that there is a balance and then a strong aspect of, of management of, of government having um, long term visions and then also involving stake, uh, key stakeholders. So that's what we were trying and or we are trying in, in Seychelles with the um, with the SSTF is that we want to bring people together and we've really realized that creating partnerships, public-private partnerships, pre creating this dialogue is so, so crucial and can really, can really go a long way. Mm, indeed. Uh, now, now I, I would like to think from the traveler's perspective, uh, because we can see the efforts that many governments on islands are doing to create this sustainable framework and to attract people more responsibly. But when you are a traveler and you look, you go to a travel agency, for example, or, or an internet, and, and you see so many offers of so mm -hmm. many different islands that are trying to attract as much tourists as they can, because the point is economic development, right? So yeah. some of them are using captive market based on uh, historical connections or geographical proximity. Uh, others are focus focusing on niche such as like luxury tourism and all that. But at, at some point, one can wonder if, they, if there's not some kind of risks uh, for an, our environment or our economies as we kind of like battling against each other for a limited market. It's not an infinite market of tourists. Uh, and so how can we avoid this? How can we maybe develop more cooperation in order to avoid that kind of environmental and social dumping while growing tourism? It's a really good question. And I, I guess it also connects back to all the work that um, that Island Innovation is doing and that with the Virtual Islands, Island Summit as well mm -hmm. in terms of 
us exchanging and trying to work together and not compete because um, in point of fact we share so many similarities yet we we are as tourism destinations so so unique and different i i can speak from 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 here from the indian ocean region i find from the indian ocean islands that i've visited they are all unique in their own way and there's so many so much potential to connect it more the trouble that we have here um and i guess it's probably similar in your region is the connectivity so as much as there would be scope to have like inter-island packages often the air travel is so expensive that guests tourists cannot really afford you know to go from zanzibar to seychelles and then maybe to mauritius um if they, they say okay we do this long haul trip then we might as well stay longer and, and combine these islands um so that is really there's a lot of scope um, to develop this further, uh, but I do I do see here in the region quite a lot of um, sort of talks for for cooperation between islands. Um, in terms of the, um, we have like Cap Business, which is based in Mauritius, which sort of groups the chambers of commerce here in the region and which have regular mm-hmm. conferences and doing also research and, and projects on how to build more sustainable tourism in the region. Um, I was also involved in an initiative where we brought together policymakers from from the region for workshops. So I think this is, this is happening from a tourism perspective, as you're saying. So how, how to make it facilitated for for tourists that's that's really i guess the key point there is providing the right information and how how are the islands how what is their usp how are they different um because often yeah if you if you say and i think it it comes back to what kind of travel do we want to attract because you know if we just want to have that sun and beach tourist that person actually doesn't care if they fly to if they fly Mm. to Mauritius or or Seychelles or Zanzibar because they just want to be in a resort by the beach and they're probably not even going to receive that resort much. But if we reach those guests where they want to have a cultural experience as well, learn about the environment, I mean, just from a perspective of being in Seychelles with its 115 islands, literally every island is different. You can be on one island where there's a huge bird colony um, and then the island next to it actually um, is a nesting ground for sea turtles. So for lovers of the of the of nature they will actually specifically seek out these places which are so unique um in yeah. terms of biodiversity and they all are uh, in in their way so it's again about how do we speak to those kind of travelers um i feel like there's more and more development in terms of having platforms specifically for sustainable tourism offers i mean the big guys like booking.com are also trying to label now um more sustainable um accommodations accordingly so things are happening uh it does go back to the fact of trying to inform as much as possible the guests um prior to to their arrival and thereby hopefully attracting um the right kind of travelers yeah, indeed. And do you think that this trend that we see developing since the pandemic with people being able to walk from anywhere and going for longer mm-hmm. trips, maybe, and staying for months in one or, or many islands could be a way to kind of like develop this cooperation between islands and having people staying longer for a deeper experience and, and traveling from one place to another? Absolutely. Um, definitely here in Zanzibar, this is something that we're seeing. We have a lot of digital nomads that have um, come here to sort of escape the pandemic in a way, because as I mentioned, Zanzibar was open throughout the time and then sort of ended up yeah, staying here, working from here, starting even maybe their little businesses here and there. So um, one of the challenges we still have is in terms of uh, good internet connectivity. And I know that's a in Seychelles. If we manage to overcome that, I think there's huge potential. Um, Zanzibar probably more than Seychelles just because the cost of living is also cheaper. So people will then be able to afford also to to stay longer. But yeah, there's there's co-working spaces and and there's great great possibility then for people here in Zanzibar to also jump over to mainland to have some Africa sort of African continent experience. So so this is some, definitely something um, that that we can build up and which would be great for the for the islands. Mm. And, and you talked about uh, a lot about the, the fact that people come to have to experience the environment and the nature and the, the natural beauties of islands, but also the culture uh, and the cultural experience and Zanzibar, like many islands in the Pacific, is full of history, is full of culture. Uh, how important 
his culture in terms of developing a sustainable uh, strategy for tourism and how can we avoid falling in the trap of maybe cultural appropriation, artificial experience, but instead making sure that the, we develop a tourism focused on culture in a way that can fit the SDGs and the need to empower uh, island communities? I mean, at the moment, it's really shocking. I, I looked at this report from 2019, which said that actually less than 1% of um, sort of experiences here in Zanzibar are related to communities or community-based experiences. Less than 1%, it's just mind-blowing. And I think only 13% actually here in Zanzibar of visitors go to um, one of our national parks, which has an endemic monkey species, which I would also think would be a great attraction. But you see that the general market here is really not, it's really this classical sun and beach um, market. So there is a lot, I would I would say, cultural appropriation and um, lack of stage authenticity as well. I mean, we have these sort of performances at hotel. You have also a lot of Maasai's who actually come from mainland Tanzania and who sort of are here on the beaches in Zanzibar and sell their goods and then kind of become part of the image of Zanzibar, but they are not from Zanzibar. So, so there's a lot of problems in that regards um, and a lot of scope to, to do more, um, to develop community-based experiences, to, to just integrate more authentically it, it, along the supply chain. I mean, so when you look at souvenirs, it's it's pretty much mass produced stuff, sometimes from Africa, but in many cases also from Ch China, you know, that gets shipped here and, and tourists don't really know. And they think just because there's like an African print on it, it's from Zanzibar and, and they have a great mm. souvenir. So it's, uh, there's a lot of work to do. Um, I do like to um, think of an example, actually from the Pacific region, um, from Vanuatu, whereby they have, um, I'm saying this because with the Seychelles Sustainable Tourism Foundation, we started a partnership with Vanuatu back in, I think it was 2017. They came to a conference that we hosted in Seychelles. And then in return, we also attended one of their island conferences in, in Vanuatu and saw with our own eyes how they really very strongly try to integrate these um traditional customs into their um, into their tourism experience and have, have a lot of pride um, attached to it. And during the pandemic, it seems that they really managed to revive this even further and have a agri-tourism initiative, which even won an Island Innovation Award recently, where they really managed to bring back a lot of sort of traditional dishes and a lot of the stories around the food culture and have their own food association and things like that. So this is this is something which could easily be done here in, in Zanzibar as well. But of course, it, you need a kind of key players to take this in, in hand as well. And you probably need to get access also to these um, large accommodations here in Zanzibar and 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 bring this these cultural products to them because many of them i guess they would in a way also be open but they don't really know how to more actively integrate it into their um into their offerings be it uh, be it food um be it activities for their guests and and so on so in this sense i think it's it can be associations it can be platforms like in seashells we have the ssdf that can try to sort of group these cultural offers and then try to promote them promote them more actively and it's it's yeah islands have so such a such a big range of of beautiful uh, cultural products that they can bring forward and that are often underexploited i think we can see that yeah. in many islands around the world yeah yes, and indeed and and so in a way uh can we reach tourism tourists while they are on the island with technology and what can be the role of technology Whereas in the destination to help develop the local experience and to make maybe connections easier, to help the local communities reach out to tourists more easily. Or on the other side, where, where the tourists are living and, and to kind of like help them prepare their experience and leave it before even leaving their own country and making sure that once they reach, then they, they reach for good reasons. Like what, what, how do you think that technology can be a, a useful tool in terms of developing a sustainable tourism? 
Oh, it, absolutely. It can be a very useful tool. I think it's still underexploited here, as I told you before, the sort of uh, cost of internet um, and also just generally reliability and access is still limited, but I think it is improving. And um, obviously through social media, we have incredible opportunities to to reach tourists in the planning process, but also while they're in the destination and to bring messages across to them. Um, in terms of mobile applications, there's also a lot on the market. I don't know really here in the Indian Ocean I'm, or here in Zanzibar, I'm not so sure how it's really used for good um, rather than just sort of for marketing. I, I have heard from an initiative in Palau whereby they have developed an app which I think is about to be launched for guests to sort of gain, in a way, sustainability credits while they are in Palau. So they can sort of do regenerative um, activities like planting trees, like offsetting their trip, um, like, uh, um, I'm just saying something, using re-friendly sunscreen. And then they gain points within the app. And through those points, they kind of get access to even more um, deeper sustainable uh, experiences in the island, like meeting with village elders or, or things like that. So that is a beautiful initiative because you would, obviously, those people who download the app are already sensitized in the first place. And then um, it would it would even take this one one step further to them to really also do something meaningful and good while they're on their travels. So there's definitely there's definitely scope for that. And I think it comes back again to this exchange between islands. So ideally, if something like that works well in Palau, why can't mm -hmm. we bring that to other islands? And it's not about competing, because at the end of the day, we all have our unique aspect. You know, the, the dishes that are made here in Zanzibar mm -hmm. are different. Um, the dances, the the cultural dresses, it's it's different. So it's not about competition, but really learning from each other and hopefully bringing these technologies then to to other islands. Yeah, and indeed, that's a great point you're making that we can definitely learn from each other and gain from that uh, without having to compete and making sure that at least we are all covered in terms of uh, protecting our islands and uh, and our environment. So that's definitely something we could. Uh, encourage for everyone um Oops. so my last question for you diana and uh, you're clearly passionate about uh your work so i'm sure you'll have plenty of ideas to share but uh what would be your advice or recommendation for anyone who would listen to you right now and who would like to be involved in in uh, sustainable tourism who would like to help his or her community uh to be more involved or, or even like the globe in general and and would need maybe guidance or, or advice from you well, living in islands, we all of us are in some way connected to tourism, right? I mean, I'm working directly in tourism, but there's many people, I mean, here in Zanzibar, in some way or the other, everyone is kind of indirectly related to tourism. So really, when we talk about tourism in islands, it concerns all of us. Um, and all of us have a, have a potential to contribute or to change it or to improve the situation of tourism in, in our islands. So it comes in a way to, and I think that's also the beauty that I see in islands, because as we have small communities and we are small places, we, we tend, if we are passionate about something, or if we want to, you know, group for a cause, we do tend to get get somewhere, right? Because I, I see this in Seychelles, it's a population of 90,000. If you really want to put sustainable tourism and, and the agenda and you you bring the right people together and you do you do awareness raising events and 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 you talk and you discuss you you do manage to to get the attention um so that's i think a beauty that we have in islands is that we really have the capacity um to change um to change things for good so it, it, be it youth or be it people already working in tourism, wanting to change something. I think it's it's all about um, finding like-minded, um, be it professional or peers or, or people who, who want to join you. And it's about choosing probably one aspect that you're passionate about being the social aspect or being at the environmental aspect. And then... Um, Try to reach out to to policymakers. Try to um, join global conversations. I think that's also a power that we have as islanders and using networks like here through the virtual island summit in in bringing up these topics and seeing how do others do it. How can that inspire me? There's a lot of um, global um, initiatives when it comes to you know fighting plastic pollution, fighting waste, or or, or developing 
cultural experiences. So trying to to tap into those um, online discussions as well, getting inspired from what others can do and bring that bring that to my communities. And at the end of the day, um, yes, getting getting active um, and and seeing that whatever you do has a direct positive effect on 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 the communities and on your environment i think this is something at the end of the day that that is rewarding then because it might be a bit overwhelming to think oh we are you know just a small island somewhere in the ocean and all these big global problems like what can we really do but um we are you know we are these biodiversity hotspots we are a top um tourism destination so there's a lot of spotlights on us so then to use that and to to really say okay how can we be places um where we really change things for good and where we innovate innovate where we work together um and then hopefully be an example um to the world and and that's why, why that's why these island networks exist because i truly believe in this um great potential that that islands around the world have Hmm. Well, if I hear you correctly, there's a, a lot of opportunities and a lot of work to do. So there's just a need for people who are motivated to get into it and uh, and start doing something. And there's also within the, the so Island Innovation has also this Island Ambassador Program. I'm, I'm also mm-hmm. part of which is also a great um, opportunity to exchange, to learn. They have a lot of tools in there, like how to communicate efficiently, how to and effectively, how to um, create events, how to create different formats. So it's it's really something um, that people can look into to join this ambassador program or to learn from that, because there's such an exchange from ambassadors around the world um uh, and really great great tools also to to support um change making indeed indeed and we can definitely encourage everyone to follow your session at the coming uh, virtual island summit if they want to learn more about sustainable tourism uh diana Absolutely. thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us and uh and again uh, probably we'll see you at the virtual island summit then it was a great pleasure thank you so much for having me thank you This was the new episode of this special series dedicated to the speakers of the Virtual Island Summit 2022 organized by Island Innovation. To know more about the summit and register for it, feel free to go to their website islandinnovation.co slash events slash virtual dash island dash summit. Pacific Talks is a podcast hosted by me, Philippe, and produced by Pacific Venture Media. If you enjoy this conversation, feel free to subscribe on any podcast platform of your choice. You can also share it on your social medias or with your friends, family, or colleagues. And if you listen to it on a podcast platform, feel free to leave us a review. This is very important to us as it helps us to reach out to more people. If you want to share your thoughts and ideas following this conversation, you can reach out to us directly by email, contact at pacificventry.com, or on all our social platforms. Until next time, with another guest, another discussion on the challenges of our islands, take care and see you soon. (laughs) 